Hey, everybody. Welcome. I am Matt McMahon. Welcome to Hey, I Know Them, where I interview an author that I know. And in this case, it's actually an, uh, an author that my wife, Lisa McMahon, knows, the incredibly talented and prolific Nicole Ostow. Nicole, thank you so much for doing this. Of course. Thank you for having me. Nicole has written over 50 works for readers of all ages, including books based on popular TV shows like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Riverdale, Charmed, Mean Girls, and now Nancy Drew, book that we're going to be talking about today. Oh, speaking of Nancy Drew, we have a very special guest that is going to be joining us soon, who is very relevant to this conversation about Nancy Drew. So stick around for that. You're not going to want to miss her in just a few minutes. Nicole, I've been really looking forward to do, talking with you about your book because our family has been big Nancy Drew fans for a long time. My wife, who is now an author, used to be a bookseller, so she sold the classic Nancy Drew books. Our daughter Kennedy grew up with Nancy Drew as her literary hero. I was a huge fan of the Nancy Drew TV show back in the 70s and had a huge crush on Pamela Sue Martin. <laughs> And now our whole family is big fans of the new Nancy Drew TV show on the CW for a very special reason, which I will reveal in just a moment. But let's dive in. I want to talk first about your career. You've been so prolific, written so many different things, but you've got this cool niche that you have carved out for yourself of writing these books based on popular TV shows like we referenced earlier. How did you get into that kind of writing? Uh, I wish I could say that it had been intentional. I, um, After I graduated college, I knew that I wanted to work in publishing. I thought that I wanted to work in magazines because I've always been very pop culture focused and I sort of, I really enjoy writing that has a very conversational tone and I liked being able, I did a lot of movie reviews and theater reviews when I was in college and I sort of wanted to be able to keep um, keep that pop culture angle to what I was working on. And as it happened, uh, you know, I graduated college, communications degree, big question mark. The first job I was offered was at Simon & Schuster. And of course, of course, you take it, right? So I took that job in the editorial department. And it turned out it was in an adult division that was super serious, really academic and dry. It was great. I mean, we worked with amazing authors. And it was, it was just really exciting to be coming straight from college into this like really iconic environment you know just even seeing Simon and Schuster which I know Lisa is familiar with you know seeing the etching on the stone like it was just right. going to work every day was thrilling but the work was not for me and when there was an internal opening in their paperbacks division I jumped on it knowing nothing at all about it and I went in for my interview with that editor and her walls were lined with Christopher Pike, and she had just acquired a new series from Francine Pascal, and it was the young adult paperback division. So this was a whole genre that I had been really obsessed with when I was at sleepaway camp as a child, but had subsequently forgotten about. And I, I mean, when I tell you, I walked in and my jaw dropped, and I was just like, okay, well, this is obviously my job. I mean, like my division did like anything i used to call them um you know the airport spinner books like anything oh, yeah. nine, nine like on a spinner rack at an airport and so we did all that all the it would have been sweet dreams although that actually wasn't us but any of those like from probably the times that you were watching nancy drew on on tv it was from that era and i just walked in and i you know i was offered the job and i took the job and among other things we did all the tie-ins so we had the Buffy the Vampire Slayer um, license, we had Charmed, we had Angel, we had the original Sabrina the Teenage Witch before it was the chilling adventures that we have on Netflix now. So I sort of came in that way and quickly discovered, and I always loved writing and really aspired to write, but also being a very um, type A kind of personality, liked having a desk and a job and a paycheck and all that. So I didn't actually have aspirations to write the way some authors do going in where they have a really clear path to, I'm going to write, you know, paranormal mysteries. That's going to be my corner. I, that wasn't my thing at all. I was just like, wow, I'm so glad to be here. But it turns out that with media tie-ins, often they're looking for people who can write within a particular wheelhouse, who can emulate a certain voice, who can learn the rules of that particular universe, and who can turn things out very quickly that are pretty clean and apparently that's my skill so um so i just sort of fell into it and i do write a lot of original stuff and i write for a lot of different ages 
but the media tie-in stuff I just keep coming back to because it's so much fun. Oh, that is amazing <laughs> how that kind of career path carved itself out for you. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about the challenges and the advantages of writing a book based on a TV show or an intellectual property as different, being different from writing your own works of fiction. Right. I mean, like I say, you know, I've always been a writer and I've always been very creative and I really relish the opportunity to write in any form, but I'm also, I've got a lot of energy, really type A, I've got all my lists and everything. And at, in many ways, writing the IP and the media tie-in work is much more like, I tend to describe it as more of a job. It can feel less creative in a lot of ways. There's not a lot of that, oh, I'm not feeling my muse today. You know, the air is too hot or I have the wrong coffee mug. Like you can't do that. You have, you know, six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks to write something and there's no space to feel, wow. um, yeah, to Those feel more like, like the lack of, you know, you can't just wait around for the artistic muse to visit you. You have to make it happen every day. You have to hit your word counts. And, um, and it's, it can be really exhausting, but for me, I think, you know, I, I've, run marathons in the past and stuff like I think for me to just dig in and just do it that's a little bit of that's how my brain works and so I I love creating my own original material but I also think there's something in me that craves um getting that phone call that's like okay here's the source material can you do this and I'm like "Mm, I think so and then just kind of diving in and not coming up for another few months so you know the challenge is also the thing that makes it very exciting the challenge of course being the really tight turnarounds, you can't afford to miss a day of work because something went wrong. And I have two small kids, so something's always going wrong. So you still, they go to bed and then you have to stay up all night, you know, making up for the time you lost. Um, and then I think also there's just the question of, again, it's a it's um, a struggle, but it's also a relief for me when you do have the pre-established canon and the pre-established characters and things. Um, I always want to really honor the source material. I vastly prefer and luckily I've been blessed like I've only had the opportunity to work on projects that I really feel passionate about and properties that I really really feel passionate about so that I can feel really connected to the characters and I can feel really excited and enthusiastic about contributing to the to that universe right Um, so I think that's a it's a challenge because you don't want to misstep and I'm sure you know if, for example, I were more heavily involved with the new TV show, I might be afraid to step into that icon's shoes because there's a lot of history and there's a lot of baggage. But right. at the same time, it really keeps you on your toes, and I think it really pushes you to um, to meet them at their level and to meet that history. Yeah. Oh, well, let's transition then and talk specifically about um, Nancy Drew and that book. This is your latest book, Nancy Drew, The Curse. And I thought this was such a fun, creepy mystery. And it had uh, such wonderful twists and really captured the feel of the show. So tell us a little bit about the premise of Nancy Drew, The Curse. So the premise is that Nancy and her friends are getting ready for another, well, it's not another, it's the first being as it's a prequel, but it's, um, a horseshoe bay it's their founder's day although maybe we changed the name in the book in the end see that's one of the pitfalls of writing these media tie-ins on such a quick <laughs> I'm like i think we had to change the name in the end but it's there's a horseshoe bay old school long-standing tradition with historical roots and as soon as they start there's um, a historical reenactment and when they start casting high school high school students in the reenactment Crazy things start happening um, in connection to the cast and the question of whether it is just bad luck or um, someone out there who's, you know, wishing them harm, causing them harm, or possibly something supernatural, that becomes the question and that becomes the mystery that Nancy needs to uncover. Oh, well, that was a great segue. So speaking of Nancy Drew, let's bring in our special guest. From the CW show, Nancy Drew herself, my daughter, Kennedy McMahon. Come on in, Kennedy. Hello. Hi, Dad. Hi, Nicole. (laughs) Hi, how are you? Very good. Thank you so much. Well, thank you both so much for being here. 
I was excited to talk with both of you because there are some themes that I feel are so prevalent in both the book and the show that I wanted to get your feedback um, from your respective mediums. So let's dive in. Let's talk story. So, Nicole, talk to us just a little bit, just briefly about the writing process. When you sat down to write Nancy Drew the Curse, did you have to pitch your concept to Noga Landau and uh, Melinda Sue Taylor, the showrunners and writers of the show? Did you have to check in with them during the writing process or did you just kind of handle that on your own? Um, I got really lucky in that when Lisa, my editor, came to me, she and her team had already come up with the seed of the idea and we fleshed it out together. But when they knew that they were going to go ahead with the prequel, the tie-in schedule being as punishing as it is, they had already determined what the what the idea was going to be. And they had, we didn't have any formal approval at that point, but when you're working with licensors, you always want to get approval at every stage. And so we didn't we were never going to go off and spend, you know, weeks like speculating about something that hadn't been approved. So they came to me with a concept that had been pre-approved. I will say, I don't know if this is off the record. Um, everyone on the team has been amazing and accessible and enthusiastic and supportive. But, but I was so excited to work on something that finally, I shouldn't say, but I should say, and like an improv. Yes. And, um, that I was so excited to be working on something that was legitimately paranormal. And maybe, Kennedy, you can say something about the way the show works. But I also write for Riverdale, where, as we know, it's like it always seems like it's going to go in that direction where it's a ghost story. But in fact, it's got some logical, plausible human explanation. And I remember saying to Lisa, oh, I'm so excited to finally write a ghost story that's actually about a ghost. And then because it's a prequel and it's supposed to happen before Nancy's life gets upended in the pilot, they said, you know, it's the calm before the storm and Nancy's really a sick. So we're not allowed to acknowledge that she's, um, that it's definitely a ghost. And I was like, I had written all these creepy flashbacks with like ghostly hands and we had to pull that all out. So that was, that was a little bit heartbreaking. And that was probably the one point of contention. And I wasn't contention, but that was the concession we made. with. with Understood. Oh, yeah. that's yeah. really interesting. So, yeah. Kennedy, let's shift to you a second. Sure. How are you involved in the story process, if you are at all? Do you ever give feedback or thoughts on the plot? Are you ever in the writer's room? That kind of thing. Yeah, so I, you know, our cast doesn't really have anything to do when it comes to plot points or where relationships are going or anything like that, that's really out of our hands completely um, because things happen in such different timelines. I mean, when they're constructing story arcs for a season, we're usually not even, we're not shooting, we're not there. Um, however, I will say our writers um, are incredibly generous with allowing us to be a part of things, much more than I would assume other writers tend to be. So we're allowed to come and hang out in the writer's room, you know, if we're obviously before this, if we were in Los Angeles, um, now we pop into the writer's Zoom and <laughs> kind of see what's going on. And they just kind of let us lurk. And, um, and you know, I think that we're all very enthusiastic and happy with letting them do their jobs because you have to, you know, let them come up with these things. However, they've always been very open to hearing our thoughts. For example, there's there's a particular storyline that I, I can't talk about, but there's something that I really hoped to pursue in our second season that I brought to our writers. And I was like, hey, I don't know if this fits in what you're thinking at all. I just want you to know that I'm really passionate about this. And I think there might be room for it in our story. And, you know, if it works, awesome. If not, awesome. That's your business. But, and that ended up being something that's a part of our season two now, which is really amazing. They're just, they're a group of people that really wants to do write by these characters and take this opportunity that they have to influence young people with our show and and take it very seriously and I think we as a cast all take it very seriously too so when it comes to story we don't really have much input but our voices are are definitely heard and I think they give us a lot of uh acknowledgement that even though they have written and created these characters in this iteration they understand that we live them every day when we're shooting the show and that it's sort of impossible to know them in the way that we individually know them 
Yeah. And if I get a script and I'm like, I feel like I'm missing, I'm missing Nancy's voice in this scene. Mm. And I can say, I, I, I don't know where her voice is here. And then they do a voice pass for that or what have you. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a really, a lot of communication I was never anticipating, but it's really satisfying to feel like they actually want us to be a part of things in that way. Oh, that's very interesting. And you said something that stood out to me was that your your writers really wanted to take care of the characters because they are so iconic. Mm-hmm. Let's switch, let's switch to that topic of taking on the icon. So there's always an inherent expectation and pressure whenever you step up to write a book or to play a character. But this is Nancy Drew we're talking about. <laughs> this is a literary and cultural icon. So Talk to us a little bit, I want to hear from both of you, on how you approached Nancy writing about inhabiting the character of Nancy, and did your approach, did your technique differ in this project than a different project just because it was Nancy Drew? Nicole, let's start with you. I would say, uh, I mean, first off, my mother is to blame for my love of books and my passion for writing. And, you know, she, she's the original Nancy Drew fan. And um, when I'm back in Brooklyn, I can show you our bookshelves where we collect vintage Nancy Drews and Hardy Boys and things. But so if I were to stop and think about it, I probably would have gone a little bit, you know, um, crazy from thinking about the legacy and, and being cautious about like picking up the, the baton. So I would say that for me, the main thing was just, I really tried to put it out of my head. I mean, I have a little bit of my own Nancy Drew connection in addition to having, you know, the vintage copies and my mother and all that. There's, um, I worked at Simon & Schuster, which was the original Stratemeyer Syndicate, which was the home of the original Nancy Drew's Once Upon a Time. And then when I left Simon & Schuster, it was to go to Grosset & Dunlop, which was originally the, if you look on the old spines, those were the publishers of the yellow Nancy Drew's. And so, and I've, you know, I was at SNS through the reiterations of Nancy and the chapter books for the younger readers. And then I was at Penguin when they were like, we're going to do the yellow spines again. So I've, so she's been around for a while with me. And so I feel like we're old friends. And so for me, the challenge, especially after seeing that beautiful pilot, um, I watched the pilot this time last summer, I was by myself with like my special NDR and my link and every or NDA and my link and everything. NDR. Oh my God. NDA. <laughs> <laughs> Corona brain. Oh my God. <laughs> Definitely edit that. Um, but so I had my, I was like, you know, it was raining out and I had my, it was on my phone. It was the only way I could access the link. And Kennedy, I have to say, I gasped and I was like, she is Nancy Drew. Like it just looked like an oil painting and it felt, it was, it's its own thing. You know, I mean, it has its own personality. It has its own vibe. The fact that there are ghosts means a lot to me. The fact that it's on the same network as this other show that people are so, um, so fanish about, you know, so for me, I was just like, okay, if we're going to do this, we're not going to think about Nancy Drew. We're going to think about this show and this iteration and this portrayal. And, um, and I, and thank goodness for the narration, which I know we talked a little bit about in our emails, um, because I felt like I could hear Kennedy and I could hear Nancy. And that really helped me find the voice of the book, which, which I think was where it all begins. Oh, that's great. Kennedy. How was it for you? <laughs> uh, there's there will be a lot of crossover, I think, to to what Nicole said in regards to. I'm trying not to think about it too much, um, but in a way, I mean, I growing up, like you had said, I had read the books and I played the computer games a lot, and I I've always been very imaginative. I was always pretending to be somebody else in my head. I still do that to this day. It's just why I you know why I love what I do, but. Um, I, I, I feel like I, I've been Nancy Drew for a long time in my head. And so I think that there was, that was an aspect of it when this project, well, I almost said this project came to me. It did not come to me. (laughs) I, I came to it. Um, but I, when I found out that it existed and was vying to audition for it, um, I read the pilot script and I was so taken aback I started reading it at my um nannying job and I was like oh my god this 
is me. I was like, this is my voice. This is my sense of humor. This is this character that if you ask me, you know, 10 years ago, if I could play one iconic character in my lifetime, I would have picked Nancy Drew 15 years ago, five years ago, you know, I, I, and so when I, it was all very kismet as I was reading it. And I just remember thinking, I actually, I, I just remember thinking I have to do this. Mm-hmm. This is mine. This was made for me. I have to do it. Um, and then I got really intimidated by all the hurdles that it takes to actually get to that point, but somehow we are here. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of intimidation because people have an expectation and obviously we're departing from parts of the the books as as they're known and then part of the original canon. And that was a little bit scary in knowing that um, hardcore fans might not be into what we were doing. Um, but I loved what we were doing and I was like I'm a hardcore fan and I think this is super duper fun and I really hope that other people see that at the very core of this our our show is created by a bunch of people that love Nancy Drew that's it it's that's always at its core that love the books that grew up with them for generations that their mothers and fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers loved you know this character in this world and the core of who Nancy is which is someone who you know, in the original book, she's following men down dark alleys. She's got her own car when she's 18 and a woman that's not, that doesn't happen. All of these things, you know, um, all those core characteristics, this rebellious nature that she has is deeply intrinsic to our story. Um, and now we have this opportunity to bring her into a modern context and make her somebody that's not perfect and not the the best daughter and the best friend and the best girlfriend or what have you, but somebody that is real is a representation of a modern young woman in a lot of ways. And see her experience life and realize that there are consequences when you throw yourself into these situations. And I think that's really refreshing and really important, uh, especially as we color our landscape with, um, in this case, a story about stories about women that look different than others. You know, I, I always say I'm so thankful to be playing a Nancy that is, can be really rude and, and brash and selfish. And it, it's a beautiful thing to get the opportunity to do that because it's real. And she has all these other amazing qualities, but, but that's kind of the thing that I, I wanted to lean into that experience of this character. And that kind of freed me, I feel like from the pressure of fitting into a mold that already existed. It's how do I take the core of who this person is that I have studied unintentionally for my entire life, that I feel like I know who she is to the people that have dedicated themselves to the books and to the computer games and what have you, and allow that to thrive in the environment that we've created for it. And so I think that that really helped me of trying to find, you know, allow the differences to flourish Right. And know that the core will always still be there. That was wonderful, both of you. Okay, we hinted at this a moment ago when we talked about narration. Kennedy, in addition to being Nancy Drew, you are also the show's narrator. Can you talk to us a little bit about how that process works? When do you record your narration? And then how does it work when you're filming a scene where you're on screen and the audio track is your recorded narration? Uh, Great question. Um, So we have two different kinds of narration in our show. Like you said, there's sort of this introductory or uh, some sort of summary at the the end of an episode that's playing over a montage of, you know, what we call an around the horn, um, which at the end of the episode is sort of where are all our characters? You know, there's George, she's doing this, like, you know, Bess is with the Marvins here and whatever. And we're just kind of collecting, like, let's check where everybody is talk about what's happened sort of in the episode. Um, So we have that narration, which I both, and then we have the narration that happens when essentially Nancy is in a conversation and we're seeing a flash of an internal thought, something, you know, quippy or what have you. Um, That lets us into her brain a little bit. So both of those are done after filming in ADR, which is where we go in a sound booth and we watch the recorded footage and it's 
if you know where if there's a sound issue on your line you're dubbing over your line uh or you're in my case also doing the voiceover so i the 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 introductory and summary voiceovers or the montages are very easy well they're easier because i'm just talking over i have a certain amount of time so you have to time it out to fit the edited footage already so i have i sent them like okay you have 36 seconds to fill so i have to make it you know not too short not too long but it has to fit this 36 seconds and you're like marking things in your brain you're like okay i should be at this point in the sentence when i see the boat and this point in the sentence when we see george's mom and like this and so you know that's you know but it's simple enough when uh the narration happens on on screen in a conversation when we're filming, <laughs> this doesn't happen as much anymore. We don't do it as much as we did earlier in the season because um, I think they just kind of wanted to move away from it. But we would be doing a scene and then our scripty, who is the person on set who um, keeps track of the scripts, make sure everybody's saying the correct lines, that nothing's getting skipped over. They also mark which takes the director likes and wants to move to editing and all that sort of stuff. They do, a, it's a very challenging job, but they keep track of a million different things. But that person also would say the line while we're in the scene so that all parties, all the actors in the scene know to save space for that amount of time. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and then I also play the line as if I'm thinking the line um, in that moment. So somebody else will be reading it unless I, you know, unless it's something more emotional and I don't want to hear somebody else's voice because I, I know what the lines are even though I'm not saying them. Right. Um, in that situation. But that's kind of how that works. Um, sometimes they'll cut them out, but they'll leave the footage of me, like doing the line in my head, essentially, in the show, but they take the line out. Okay. So I just sort of looks like I'm going. <laughs> like, <laughs> just like I'm really overacting and nothing moment. Um, but yeah, I think that's, they just moved away from it. But that's how that works. Oh, that is so interesting. Okay, Nicole, you wrote your book in first person point of view with Nancy as the narrator. Did you do that intentionally to match the vibe and the feel of the show? Or was that something that you just chose for a different reason? I wish I could remember exactly. I think, you know, so I was coming off of another high profile project from the same channel that was, or the same network, I suppose, um, where each story explicitly needed to have multiple points of view, which I love because the characters all have their own voice and it's really, it's fun to be able to jump around and anytime something's feeling a little laggy, you could just jump into someone else's head and sort of move things along that way. Um, but I didn't, it didn't feel like quite the right, no, I didn't have any mandate, you know, with the, with other projects, there were specific um, directions saying like, no, we want it to be multiple point of view. The fans are really into the different, you have to do it that way. And I was like, oh, okay, we'll do it that way. Um, and <laughs> with this one, I was like, nobody said anything in particular. They said, can you write a prologue and we'll take it, you know, we'll all see how we're feeling after you do that. And I watched the pilot and I read the script and I thought about the plot that we talked about and I sat down and I thought, well, you know, for me, the big thing, going from property to property and connecting is all about finding that entry point where you genuinely feel like you know what's going on in these characters' heads and where you genuinely feel like you can anticipate, as, as you were saying, Kennedy, like this is something that Nancy would say or this doesn't quite feel right. You have to, for me at least, I feel like I have to feel as though I understand the property or the project well enough to be able to say, well, that's not something Nancy would say or that wouldn't happen. And so I need to be able to think in, Nancy's voice. Um, and so I was very grateful for the narration and for the voiceover, because I think one thing that I tend to lean heavily on in my own writing is that sort of that aside and that inner monologue thing. So I was like, oh, good, this character does that. So I can just let it go. And you know, we can always edit it out if I go too far with it, which is my usual fallback. But, um, but I was really glad that it was there because her voice was so distinct and so pronounced. And it really gave me something to sort of grab onto. And at that point, I was just, if someone had said, please, you know, put in other characters. I would have been happy to do so, but her voice was so well formed and it, it really guided the story. So I didn't feel any impulse to, and it, for me, you know, it was just nice to do something different, to write a whole book in one point of view. Great. Like, that's exciting. That's a change of pace. Oh, that's great. That is very interesting to see how you both approach that. 
let's shift gears just a minute and um, let's talk about romance. So for me, Nicole, as I read the book, one of the things that stood out to me was Nancy's romantic relationship with one of the male characters in the, in the book. And the tension between her desire for a romantic relationship and her frustration that she felt over the guy's hesitancy to give her full support for her investigations because he was concerned for her safety. And to me, that spoke to a larger theme of how men can often either consciously or subconsciously treat women in a demeaning or unequal way. And Kennedy in the show, obviously, Nancy's love life has struggled just a bit. Has it? Yeah, I think we could say that. So I'd love for <laughs> you both to talk a little bit about how that romantic relational tension, dynamic issue manifests itself. McCall for you in the book and Kennedy for you in the show. Uh, McCall, let's start with you. Well, for me, the main issue as with the love interest and with all of the world that we were building was that I had to make um, a world with friends and boyfriends and an environment that was not going to be replicated once you got to the pilot so that it was discreet and I don't want to say disposable, but that you could put it aside and then move on to the show and to the current timeline, um, but that fans of the show would still be invested in and would want to read about. So creating all those new characters was really daunting because I was, you know, like 80% of what you tune in for is Nancy and Bess and George and Nick. So, you know, you want, you want all of that. So I was like, well, he can't be Nick, right? Whoever she's interested in just can't, it has to be so divorced from the TV show because otherwise, what is she doing with Nick? Like there needs to be some, and there needs to be a compelling enough reason that she's with him in the first place. And I think that you do see on the TV show so much of that um, longing for normalcy and longing for the return to the time when her mother was alive and things were, were just regular and she could just be a high school teenager. So I thought, well, in my heart, I think that Nancy is so much more sophisticated and complicated. She's not a regular teenager, but I do think that's what she's missing in that first season. And that's, that's what a lot of the younger viewers connect to. So, well, I think, let me just say this. I think Nancy deserves better than the boyfriend that she had in the prequel. Like I would, if I were your mom, Nancy, I would say, don't like, please don't waste your time. But, but for the readers, I was like, well, here's a character and here's a plausible reason why he couldn't possibly be end game for her. And I, I can see his appeal to her at this point in her life, but he's got to be, less interesting than Nick and everyone that comes on the show. So that was, that was how I approached that. And, and I think it was just, as you say, I was sort of biased by the fact that Nancy is so can do and so complicated that I was like, right. well, what, what guy's going to hold the candle to that anyway? So. Well said. Oh, I like that. So Kennedy, how about you? Um, talk about that from your perspective. Yeah. Um, well, I think this initial tension between Nancy wanting to be who she is and go full throttle solving these mysteries and throwing herself in danger's way and what have you, this, this kind of reckless pursuit of justice that is at the core of who she is. It sort of has always, since the beginning of Nancy Drew time, been an issue for her and her romantic relationships. I mean, even in like very old school classic Nancy and Ned, it was always, uh, oh yeah, Ned's my boyfriend, but I'm busy doing something else. And Ned's sort of like, um, do you still like me? <laughs> she's like, yeah, 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 I like you, it's fine. And like, I'm gonna go and do what have you. And, and she's kind of in a way, a bit of, it ignores his desires and what he's looking for in a relationship because she's, you know, there's just conflict there. There's somebody that doesn't, so that's always been a part of the story. Right. Um, in the show, that's this is a spoiler for anybody who hasn't watched season one so we'll just pause that right there but if you have seen it you would know nick and nancy's relationship doesn't work out as it stands right now because a lot of it being i want to go and figure out what's going on with my life and my family and i don't i'm too afraid 
to share that with someone constantly all the time. And Nick was in a position where he was saying like, why aren't you telling me, tell me this, be safe, do the thing, whatever. And it's just sort of, I think in Nancy's mind, there's no, she doesn't understand why the two have to intersect. Like to her, she's like, I'm going to go and live my life and then I'll come, you know, hang out with you and it'll be fine. And there's no, but then, you know, feelings are involved and you start to care about somebody and their safety and what have you. Um, and I think that she's used in, in the show so far, romance and intimacy and has served a purpose of distraction in a lot of ways for her has been something that she's used to fill this really gaping loss that she feels. And, um, the the, mentally I think she doesn't know how to confront the loss of her mother and all of these things that she's experienced throughout the season she doesn't know what to to do with those feelings and she doesn't want to confront them she doesn't feel like she has time or she doesn't feel like it's worth it and so she kind of blinds herself and numbs herself to that by pursuing romance with the number of people that she's pursued romance with in the show so far um And yeah, I think the key for her is finding somebody, you know, or at least having the right timing with somebody who is just as enthusiastic Mm. and thinks the same way as she does. That is a partner to her instead of somebody that's trying to reel her in. Well, even if they're doing it unintentionally. Right. And so, yeah, we'll see. Hopefully there will be that person or that timing. But hey, we shall see. We shall see, indeed. Hey, let's switch gears um, and talk. We, we hinted at this a little bit earlier. Let's switch gears and talk about the supernatural element. In the classic Nancy Drew books, there was no supernatural element. There was a rational explanation for all the creepy, mysterious things that were going on. In the CW show, the supernatural is very real. Nancy starts out the season as a skeptic, but due to some very creepy firsthand experiences that she has, she starts to open herself up to it. And then in McColl, you, I thought, walked a great line of the supernatural theme in both the plot arc and in Nancy's own personal feelings about that particular topic and her beliefs about that topic. So McColl, just share a little bit about how you chose to tackle the supernatural element in your book. If it were up to me, it would have been ambiguous, but maybe less so. I mean, personally, I love horror movies. I love scary things. There's a tiny part of me that does not necessarily believe that there is such a thing as a ghost, but I could be persuaded. You know, if you if you wanted to talk me into it, I might be open to it. Um, so I'm always happy to add it in. And like I said, um, I can write a creepy thriller all day and I can read one too for that matter. Um, but the opportunity to make it sort of unambiguously, definitely a ghost story, I was so excited about. So that was, it was, it was sad to me to have to pull that back a little bit, um, but I completely understand why it made sense in the greater context of the, of the TV show and that story arc. Um, so it was, it was nice. I mean, in my head, if you, if you read The Curse, if you haven't yet and you are reading it, I would say just any scene where it seems like there might be something going on, like behind, literally behind that curtain or, you know, written in the fog or something, it's there. It's definitely there. It's not your imagination. That was how I intended it. And, um, and we pulled it back just to be consistent, which is very important. Um, sure. But I say, I say go all out. Like I'm here for it, for any supernatural you want to bring into the TV show. I'm into it. Oh, that's fantastic. Kennedy, how about you? Talk to us a little bit about Nancy's belief arc regarding the supernatural and how you approach that from an acting standpoint. Yeah, so it's very important to us to stay consistent in in that Nancy absolutely, definitely does not believe in ghosts when we start the show. And that's who she is intrinsically as a character since the beginning of Nancy Drew Time. Um, And so that was very important and that there was a very, there had to be this development of that sense and these obstacles kind of put in the way of why she was so resistant to it. Um, And as the show continued to get more and more supernatural and to a point where um, 
it was sort of unavoidable and she just had to come to terms with like, okay, well, I guess this is it. Um, first of all, I think it's really fun because it's challenging a character that is so excellent at figuring out the tangible, challenging her with something entirely intangible and seeing how her, her brain can kind of work through that and solve mysteries in a very different sort of way. But obviously I think our, our main hang up for her of why it was, even though all of these things were presenting themselves as pretty firm evidence of the existence of the supernatural. We had one of my very favorite scenes of the season in episode four, um, where Nancy goes and visits her mom's grave and essentially says, I've had to come to terms with the fact that there are ghosts in this world and it's been so difficult for me because if there are ghosts in this world, then where are you? Oh. And it's so, it like makes me wanna cry just thinking about that scene is so beautifully written. Um, that line resonated with me so much. Like that was amazing. It was, it was a beautifully seen, uh, a beautifully written scene by Celine Geiger, one of our writers. Um, and it's very emotional, of course, because she doesn't understand why this town ghost story is haunting her and her own mother is not. And yet, we, you know, as we discover, those things are intertwined. Um, but, you know, having to come to terms with the fact that she doesn't understand why she's not enough for Kate to come back and, and, and see her it is is a huge challenge for her but it comes to a point where things are developing so rapidly that she kind of it's, it's either you're hopping on or you're being left behind um and a whole world of possibilities you know opens up and she actually does get to get that moment with with her mother in a supernatural sense with the whisper box episode um where she's in an alternate reality of her perfect life um so yeah, but it's a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to kind of, but it happened kind of fast. We kind of just had to, the show developed in such a, a, a fast pace with the supernatural stuff, kind of leaned really heavily into it earlier on. And I think maybe we had anticipated, but I think it was a, a blast. So it kind of was just a quick, like, all right, we're all here and we're going, we're going in. So it's been a lot of fun. Well, that scene you referenced with Nancy at her mother's grave was written beautifully but you killed that scene from an acting standpoint. Oh, I remember crying watching you do that. Partly just because you're my daughter. But yeah. It, it does a, help. Yeah. Um, I know. The writing made it easy. We'll take your word for it. <laughs> um, one last question for you guys. Uh, teenage voice. Let's talk about that for just a second. In the book, Nancy's 17, I believe, a junior in high school. And in the show, Kennedy Nancy is just graduated from high school and she's 18, I think, at the start of the season. Te she's technically 19. Okay, 19. She was under, this is another spoiler, uh -oh. <laughs> but she was under the impression that she was 18. Oh, right. I forgot about that. That's exciting. <laughs> she's actually a whole year older. Wow. So in, in a sense, you're both playing down in age from a writing standpoint and an acting standpoint. McColl, as an aspiring middle grade and YA author myself, I was so impressed by the authenticity that you brought to the teenage voices of your characters. Do you have any tips or do you have a process that you use to write authentic teenage voices? You know, I, my background is in writing YA in the work for hire and the media tie-ins, but also in original. And for a really long time, I, when I would go on panels and they would say, but you're not a teenager. How do you do that? I would say, well, that's just where my brain got stuck. You know, on the inside, I feel like I'm 16 and for better or for worse, like it's not, this is how I think. And it sounds like a teenager. So enjoy. Um, and I'm, further away from those years now and I have as I referenced before I have an eight-year-old going on nine and a four-year-old going on five and I woke up 
one day um, a few months ago, a few years ago, I don't even know. And I remember saying to one of my writing friends who was experiencing a similar sort of paradigm shift. And I said, you know, I don't feel like a teenager anymore. I don't necessarily feel my age, whatever that means per se. Um, I genuinely don't know what that means, but I definitely don't when I sit down to write YA, I, it no longer comes as easily as it did. And I definitely am seeing things from the perspective of a middle-aged woman who has two children to think about and the life experiences, which for the most part are great, but the life experiences that come with that. Um, and I thought, well, I don't know, maybe I'm not going to write YA anymore because I just don't feel 16 anymore. And that's fine, but you know, and then the opportunity to write the Mean Girls book came along and then from there other properties and then Nancy Drew and I thought to, and I found that if I was entering through that door where there's these pre-established voices in this pre-established universe I mean I'm, I'm really flattered that you say that it's that it's a believable voice or that it's um, contemporary because that is one of the things I think about I'm like I'm so far removed to the point where now especially because my kid is you know, she's eight, nine going on like 15 and she's embarrassed by everything I do. And she's already like so much cooler than I am and everything, <laughs> all my slang is outdated. So I've just sort of leaned into it. I'm constantly referring to how out of touch I am. Like I basically play myself as like the 70, the golden girls version of myself in real life because I can't, there's no going in the opposite direction. So we may as well just sort of ironically embrace <laughs> the future. Um, Love it. Think I do think that um, having the voices of the characters really helped me, and I think with Nancy in particular, obviously the prequel is earlier than the show, and therefore she's a bit younger. But I think Nancy is so precocious and so articulate, so that there was also space to be a little bit more sophisticated. You know, let's let's be real: the dialogue that you read in a book, no matter how contemporary it is or how accessible it is, it's still the, it's the same as a script. It has to be authentic, but it can't sound like two people talking because that's not how movies and and that's not how art works so that's not how believable art works in my opinion got it oh that's very interesting kennedy as a mature i would say 23 year old <laughs> you're playing a teenager was there any particular challenges that that um brings to you and is there any particular techniques that you utilize to bridge that gap uh, well, I'll be honest. I've always really struggled with that part of my job. Um, from the moment I auditioned for the show, they're like, you're great, but you, we, uh, you seems like you're 28. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I feel like I've been 35 since I was nine years old. So like, I don't really, I, I, I've just always sort of had that older soul. I don't know. I just feel like I don't, I'm just a very tenacious person. I, I just have, you know, my eyes on the future and uh, kind of always been that way. And I think I learned from a very young age to be, to be self-sufficient because of um, my childhood experience with OCD and all this sort of stuff is, is a lot of things that I learned to rely on myself because my dad was super neglectful of me. And I'm just yeah, <laughs> sorry about that. It just sounded like that's where I was going, which, <laughs> um, but I think I, that's part of it too. Is I have parents who treat has have always treated me with respect and always treated me like an adult, and I, I, you know, entered a serious relationship when I was very young. I just feel like I've been a little bit on like on a faster track, and so I've always come across older than I am. So I've been told, and so when it comes to playing a teenager, because nobody, you know, if you're casting a teenager or anything, they're at least 22, like um, we, most likely with some exceptions. But I remember, yeah, part of the big hang up that they had before they cast me was being really worried that I wouldn't be able to re like reliably sell 18. And I remember going into like our final audition and my agent was like, put your hair in a ponytail, and put on some sneakers and put on a t-shirt. <laughs> and like don't wear makeup and just do it <laughs> and in the most loving and kind way and so that's what we did and it like, totally changed up the look that I had going and what have you and and thankfully they agreed um but once we're shooting the show it's just sort of like Nancy as a character is so beyond her years in courage in intellect in you know so many things so that kind of plays to 
it helps me with my weakness, which is playing younger, because it's very challenging as an actor when you're pursuing truth and you're you're trying to be as honest as you can in, in in any situation, but then you're balancing that, of course, with playing a character and understanding that those that character is going to have different reactions than you, or is going to respond to things differently. But it is hard to manipulate age in a way that doesn't feel false. Right, that makes. And sense. so, thankfully, Nancy is somebody yeah that is kind of older than she is mentally. Um, and I think that because I also am, I also don't think there's a huge, huge difference between, if you're that kind of person, I don't think you change all that much between 18 and 23, say. Yes. I feel like I'm pretty, I mean, obviously in, in a lot of ways I've, I've hopefully improved, <laughs> um, but I changed a lot, of course, but, but in like who, and how I'm perceived, I don't think it's changed uh, an insane amount since then so yeah it's very challenging thankfully I don't have to write my own words so or or her responses you know and and I think that it, it tends to be the way that I play certain reactions to things and, and scenarios that are presented to Nancy as a character um I think that there are ways in which I choose to skew that in a less emotionally mature way which uh, uses her, yeah, you know, in not knowing how to interact with, you know, her dad or not know, you know, that those are always the times where I feel like she's the youngest when she's with her dad, you know, or when she's with Carson and like leaning into those moments because she's easily like the oldest mentally of her friend group. Right. But then you can't escape being a daughter when you're playing those scenes. And I think that that's where I do my best to show her youth but it's hard it's hard so <laughs> i think you always, i always feel as though nancy on screen feels to me the way i felt on the inside as an 18 year old like that's I a great point why an adult looking like i can appreciate why me now i'm like is she 18 not that i've ever questioned that you know but <laughs> like someone someone who's older might look back might have concerns about you know older people playing teenagers etc I don't, as it happens, because I I grew up with the original 90210. But when I but when I watch Nancy now, I'm like, oh no, that is how I felt inside my head when I was 18. I thought I was that sophisticated. So for me, that it just makes sense. That is an excellent point, and I completely agree. I feel like in a lot of ways, I mean, that's one of the cool things we can do with TV is you get to play out this kind of fantasy of who you were when you were a teenager, or what have you. Okay, uh, let's wrap this up by asking, Nicole, what's next? What are you working on? What can we be looking forward to? Well, speaking of paranormal, I have a short story in the Horror Writers Association. Um, they're having an anthology come out. It's a tribute to R.L. Stein's Are You Afraid of the Dark? And it's um, Don't Turn Out the Lights is the name of it. We had to go through a few iterations. So that comes out in September. So I have a short story in there that I'm really excited about because not R.L. Stein. I just gave you the wrong name of the author. I will look up the name of the author, but it's R.L. Stein is in the collection, which is oh, why I'm so excited and I'm fangirling out because it's my first time being in a book with him. Um, but it's Are You Afraid of the Dark? It's a tribute. It's an anthology tribute to Are You Afraid of the Dark? And I can do a better <laughs> do a better rendition of that for you if you need it. Um, with authors such as Barry Liga, R.L. Stein, um, Cami Garcia, like just a huge all-star roster that I'm so excited to be included on. Um, and what else? Oh, I have a picture book. I have my very first illustrated picture book for little kids called Sullivan, who is always too loud. And that will be out in September. And at some point, although who knows, because lots of printing schedules have been delayed. Um, now that the comics industry is getting back on its feet, I have an original graphic novel for season four of Riverdale, which will be out soon. I don't know. I'm excited. I'm excited. It's, I've never written a graphic novel. I've done comics for them, but I've never written a graphic novel full length. So this will be fun. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, I can't yeah. wait to see those. Kennedy, yeah. um, where can people watch season one and tell us whatever you can about season two. I know things are a little up in the air right now, but when do you anticipate season two being available? So for season one, you can watch on CWTV.com or on the CW app for free. 
all of season one. Or if you have um, HBO Max, you can stream all of season one there. Um, as for season two, uh, our premiere date is in January. So everything's changing, you know, everything's a little bit crazy. Um, but I think that, that that seems very likely. So season two will be premiering in January and it's gonna be a very good one. I think uh, I think people will like it very much. I have oh. a lot of questions. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, last thing, contact info. Where can people find you, connect with you, website, social media handles, that kind of thing, Nicole? So my website is Nicole Ostow. That's, well, we'll see it in the interview link, but it's M-I-C-O-L-O-S-T-O-W. Um, Dot com. So that's McColeOstow.com. Uh, Twitter is McColeZ, M-I-C-O-L-Z. Uh, Instagram is also McColeOstow without a period, but it is mostly pictures of my dog. So I apologize. It's not, it's not a super professional space. But Nothing that's wrong me. with that. Kennedy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, probably just Instagram is Kennedy McMahon. I have a Twitter as well that I live tweet um, on the days that our show is there, but I don't really use that for anything else anymore. Great. But yeah, you can find me there. I mostly put pictures of my dog, too. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Doris. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, Nancy Drew the Curse by the amazing Nicole Ostow is available everywhere you buy books. Season one of Nancy Drew, starring the incredible, the one and only my daughter, Kennedy. Yeah, <laughs> is available for streaming on CWF, on HBO Max, CW website, and also available for purchase on Amazon, should you choose to do so. So that is it for this episode of Hey, I Know Them. If you like this video, it would really help me out if you click the like, the subscribe, the notification button, and even share it with a friend. I post videos once a week on personal development, writing advice, and book recommendations. So everybody go out and buy Nancy Drew the Curse. Go, everybody go out, watch the CW show, Nancy Drew. And McCole and Kennedy, thank you so much for spending this time with us. And thank you. It has been awesome. And thanks for watching, everybody. See you next time. Thanks so much. <laughs>